So thank you for joining uh, today's webinar on low overhead dairy grazing, financial and environmental performance. I'm Kelsey Virgin. I'm a project manager with the Wall Center who's hosting this webinar today. Uh, to start us off, I'm first gonna go over some logistics for the webinar and I'll talk briefly about Walla Center and Pasture Project. Then we'll go into our presentation and then we'll have some time at the end for your questions. Uh, in terms of Zoom technology, I believe we're probably all pretty familiar with it at this point, um, but we do ask that you keep yourselves muted during the presentation, um, but you should feel free to put your questions in the chat box as you have them. We'll have time at the end of the presentation to address them, but uh, John Winston, our presenter today, he is going to be presenting a lot of numbers and data. That's all very interesting and very relevant, um, but if you need some clarification at any point during those parts of the presentation, uh, feel free to use the raise your hand function in Zoom um, and we'll uh, call on you and you can unmute and ask your question. We want to make sure everybody has the clarification they need during those sections. Um, but all your questions, we'll answer them at the end of the presentation as well, if you have kind of bigger picture questions too. Um, if you have any technical difficulties, you can put those questions in the chat box and we'll do what we can to help you out. Um, sometimes it just is a matter of leaving the call and rejoining and that usually fixes things. Um, <clears throat> there will be a short follow-up survey that pops up just after the webinar is over. Uh, please take a moment to complete this. It does help us as we develop our future webinars. And then as you heard, this webinar is being recorded and it will be available on the Pasture Project YouTube channel in the coming week. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about Wallace Center. So Wallace Center works nationally to bring together diverse people and ideas to co-create solutions that build healthy farms, equitable economies, and resilient food systems. Our vision is that all communities have the power to nourish themselves and regenerate ecosystems through just food and agricultural systems. At the heart of these systems are dynamic networks of people connected through interdependent relationships with each other and the land. Pasture Project um, is an initiative of the Wall Center that works to advance and integrate regenerative grazing as a scalable market-driven solution for building healthy soil, viable farms, and resilient communities in the upper Midwest, and specifically in a six-state region in the upper Mississippi River Basin. Although we do work with some national audiences, uh, the Pasture Project provides farmers, grazers, land managers, and others with a data back case for the economic, environmental, and social benefits of implementing regenerative grazing. We continue to build a strong alliance of partners for supporting regenerative grazing and other regenerative management practices across the Upper Mississippi River Basin. And we host webinars like this one as part of our education and outreach efforts to promote regenerative grazing. A little bit about our presenter today. Uh, Dr. John Winston is an agricultural economist with over 20 years experience working on sustainable livestock production systems and natural resource management. His focus has been on the adoption of appropriate technology for reducing production costs and improving environmental performance of livestock and crop agriculture. Dr. Winston served as the chief of party for Winrock's successful Sustainable Dairy Global Development Alliance project in Kazakhstan from 2006 to 2009, which trained farmers in dairy grazing techniques. He was a member of the technical team that authored the Grazing Land and Livestock Management Carbon Offset Methodology for the American Carbon Registry. In 2014, he co-authored a set of case studies on grazing management for cow-calf operations in the Mid-South, focusing on the potential for reducing net greenhouse gas emissions and increasing productivity through increased soil health. So thank you, John, for presenting today. We're really lucky to have your expertise. Um, and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and let you share yours and take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Kelsey. I appreciate that introduction and uh, the opportunity to present this information. Let me see if I can successfully share my slides. Uh, hold on just one second. Just made you a co-host, so see if that makes it easier. Okay. Let's see. Mm. 
How about that? There we go. Kelsey, can you see him? Yep. Okay, great. Well, um, thanks for the introduction and uh, I appreciate uh, folks um, on the webinar. Um, uh, as as Kelsey said, you know, if there are questions um, that need, you know, for clarification, please um, feel free to, to put up your electronic hand and otherwise we'll try to save most of the questions uh, and answer period at the end. But what I want to, um, sorry, I have to get this to forward now. There we go. Um, the big picture here really is, uh, you know, how can we have profitable agriculture based on permanent vegetative cover in order to get the environmental benefits that science tells us will come from, from that type of farming. So um, just to give you a, uh, an overview of, of what I'm gonna talk about here, I'm gonna start with some basics of dairy farm financial analysis and some context about the dairy sector because I think that's necessary information to understand some of the other points that I'm gonna make uh, as I get into the analysis that we've done. And the focus of that, as the title uh, indicates, is, is what we're calling um, low overhead dairy grazing. And as you'll see there, it says larger herd low overhead dairy grazing, and, and that's really part of the system, and I'll explain that. Um, the takeaway points that I think are important, and I'll just lay them out here at the beginning, the dairy sector really needs a viable alternative to the current trend towards many farms going out of business, exiting the industry, and a consolidation with many fewer, much larger farms in a um, you know modern confinement uh, dairy production system. And I'm going to talk about that some. Uh, secondly, the investment. The level of investment and subsequent debt that a lot of farms have per cow and per hundredweight causes um, concerns about cash flow and maintaining positive cash flow to trump decisions on profitability. And, and that is a little bit backwards from a business standpoint. Uh, this low overhead dairy grazing system, and we use this sort of lodge acronym, uh, the, the efficiencies are feed efficiency, labor efficiency, and importantly, and where the overhead cost part comes in is in capital efficiency. And I'm going to talk about all of those. Um, the results of the analysis really are that net farm income per hundredweight, which is, in my opinion, the most important profitability measure in dairy farm financial analysis. The results that we're getting from an analysis that we've done that I'm going to explain in some level of detail uh, is really that that profitability measure is about four times greater than the average that I was able to get from a data set of farms in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. And we're going to talk about this. And really the, the, the important point here is that really what we're seeing is, oops, I'm sorry. A uh, it's really a win-win um, system, it seems, more profitable for farmers and produces environmental and social benefits. So into the weeds we go. Dairy farm financial analysis basics. So I just want to say, and many of you know this already, uh, I'm sure, but just in case some don't, right? There's three major uh, financial um, uh, forms that we use in dairy farm financial analysis. The cash flow statement, which really tells you, can you or can you not pay your bills, right? So it includes all the cash uh, revenue and expenses. It includes principal payments on debt, but it doesn't include depreciation because depreciation is really not a cash expense. It can be deferred. Then there's the income statement or what's also called the profit and loss. Uh, and from that, we get the net farm income from operations. Um, you'll hear me use that just as net farm income and I use that synonymously. The from operations part really just means that we're not including non-farm income, which a lot of dairy farms have and a lot of dairy farm financial analyses will include non-farm income. And it's hugely important to dairy farm farmers and their families, but it's not what we're interested in looking at right here. 
Um, and so in the income statement, you have accrual accounting, meaning that you're um, uh, taking into account changes in, in inventories from beginning to end of year, et cetera. Uh, and it includes depreciation because it's a real expense, even if it's not a cash expense. And it doesn't include principal payments, right? Because those are really um, a trade between you and the bank or whatever your lender is. So the balance sheet is the third one. And that really tells you what you own, what you owe, and the difference, which is your net worth. And the reason I even mention it here is that I do talk a little bit about um, rate of return on assets, which I think is an important uh, financial metric. So, uh, and this, and basically the, uh, the return on assets can, can tell you the efficiency of, of the farm's assets at producing profit. So a little bit more about the basics, um, direct costs, right? These are costs on the farm that result directly from producing milk. Grain, fuel, fertilizer are examples, okay? This is similar to, but not exactly the same as variable costs, but you could think of it in the same way. Overhead costs, which are very similar to fixed costs, uh, are really the costs of maintaining and running the farm buildings, machinery, equipment, et cetera. So um, to continue the discussion about the context of the dairy sector, right? One of the most important um, issues is increasing variability in milk price that farmers receive. And this graph comes, I think it's USDA data, but I, I got this graph out of a farm credit publication. Um, you can see around the year 2000 here, um, and Kelsey, can you see my cursor on the screen? Yeah, I can. Okay, good. So around here, uh, you can see the variability really started to get much greater. And it was an upward trend till about 2014, where there were some very high milk prices, and then the bottom just fell out. Um, and, and this is problematic. The variability is problematic. The direction is problematic, um, and it's been a real struggle since 2014. A couple of short, good periods in milk prices recently, but um, it, it's really been tough. And so, of course, milk price is hugely important in dairy farm profitability. And so this next slide is, again, from that same farm credit publication, net earnings per cow. And you can just see, similarly, you know, the huge variability in in profitability of the dairy farm. So <clears throat> I thought about uh, skipping this slide because it's a little bit thick, but um, I think it's really an important, there's important points buried in here and I hope to be able to make them clear. So this is what I call the overhead cost dilemma, right? And, and I think this is part of what's going on in, in for, well, in the dairy farm, in the dairy farm sector, right? So generally uh, you've got a lot of money invested in buildings and equipment relative to cows and land. And um, for a lot of farms that results in relatively high debt. And in most farms that, uh, in most farms feed cows in confinement or in partial confinement, you know, need a stall for each cow. And so there's a limited herd size that you can have. And that then leads to high overhead costs per cow. And if you have high overhead costs per cow, um, on top of all of the direct costs that you have, e margins are very thin, very slim. And you really, this is what pushes most dairy farmers to strive for maximum milk production per cow in order to keep cash flow positive. This is how cash flow um, becomes so important, the important metric for most dairy farmers, unfortunately. A couple things about this. One is that maximizing milk per cow is not conducive to grazing. It's not consistent with grazing, right? Because cows are expending their energy out in the field, in the pastures for their feed and um, they may be healthier out there, but they're not going to produce as much milk as if you had them in the barn with a controlled 
total mixed ration or or whatever you use in the barn, right? So in in this way, cash flow seems to trump profitability. And and what does this mean? This has been something I haven't until recently really been able to understand that well, right? I'm an economist. And one of the basic tenets of economics is that when the price of what you're producing goes up, that's a signal to you to produce more of it because it's more profitable. Um, when the price goes up, dairy farmers try to produce more if they can. Um, and economic theory will tell you when the price of what you're producing goes down, try to produce less of that and switch to something else. Well, that's really where the catch is. In dairy farms, um, when the milk price goes down and revenue goes down, they think, how am I going to keep cash flow positive? I need to produce more milk. And so whether the price goes up or goes down, farmers are trying to produce more milk. And I think that's what's creating that increase in variability. Um, it's just not consistent with the laws of supply and demand. It is rational, and the reason farmers are doing it is because they have all these overhead costs that are dairy specific. So they can't just switch to something else. It doesn't make sense. So so there you have it. And that's how cash flow can prohibit profitable decisions. And I'll explain a little bit more about that a little bit later. So I want to just talk a little bit about large modern confinement dairy production because that's the direction the industry is headed in. And it's important to understand that to some degree, right? It's, that's really about efficiency. It's about maximizing output from a given level of inputs. Uh, it's about economies of scale, which is spreading costs out over as many hundred weights of milk as you can. Personally, I, I find these operations very impressive, right? The management of hundreds of cows or thousands of cows and having a herd average across all those cows of over 25,000 pounds per cow, um, it, it, it takes incredible management. But so, so, you know, I tip my hat to folks who are doing that. However, I also feel, and this is just my own opinion, that farms like that are a tightrope for so many reasons. The animals, the animal physiology, right? The cows are getting pushed so hard in their, the ration they're getting fed to produce so much milk that they get burned out very quickly and the call rates are very high. Um, labor is a real problem, right? Well, a lot of farms are going to robotics, et cetera. Um, from an environmental standpoint, with lots of nutrients being concentrated on relatively small footprint of land, the ability of soils to assimilate the nutrients causes nutrient losses and environmental problems. And quite honestly, I think it's a financial tightrope. I think they're able to get slim margins over lots of hundred weights, which is great when that margin is positive. But when that margin, that slim margin becomes negative over lots of hundred weights, it can be big losses too. So that, that's how I feel about large modern dairy confinement. Uh, I respect folks who can do it. I'm impressed by their ability to do it. And I think it's, it's a tightrope for all these reasons. So let me start to talk about this low overhead dairy grazing system a little bit. Um, how do you reduce overhead costs per cow and importantly per hundred weight of milk produced? Um, it doesn't make sense to uh, you know, if you have a, a traditional farm with 100 or 150 or 200 cows to just figure out how to sell off some equipment or sell off some buildings, um, that's not really what we're talking about. What we're talking about is finding an efficient way to increase your herd size. And that can be done through a high throughput milking system and an efficient feeding system. Both of these really for labor efficiency. And really trying to maximize the ratio of the value of cows and land to the value of buildings and machinery, right? Because cows and land are really your money-making assets. Buildings and machinery are necessary to some extent, but they're not really the things that are making you money. So this involves cost-effective animal housing choices, um, trying to minimize buildings and machinery costs per cow and per hundred weight. Now, I want to be careful when I say this, right? Because I, I don't mean always less buildings and less machinery is better, right? Buildings, having a barn versus outwintering your cows can help you produce more hundred weights of milk, right? And so it could be cost effective. 
you need to look at the numbers, but it's really trying to minimize these on a per hundred weight basis that I think is important. And so uh, just looping back to the, the basics of, of dairy farm financial analysis, right? What the low overhead dairy grazing system is trying to do is really reduce the total cost structure, the direct costs through efficient feeding and efficient labor and the overhead costs through capital efficiency, right? So trying to reduce those costs per hundred weight. So what are the types of efficiency? And I guess I've already mentioned these really, but feed efficiency is hugely important in any grazing, well, any dairy farm. And the way grazing does it, right, is to try to minimize feed costs per hundred weight of milk shipped. And how do you do that? By maximizing the nutrient intake from grazing with smart supplementation, if that's what you want to do. There are a number of farms now that are 100% grass fed, so they're not supplementing grain. That's a, a, a little bit of a niche uh, market. So anyway, um, labor efficiency. The goal there really is to maximize the amount of milk you ship or sell per worker, per, per full-time equivalent worker. And how do you do that? Well, a couple ways are having a high throughput milking parlor that allows you to milk more cows more quickly. And a lot of farmers who are using this kind of system are, are have a seasonal pattern to their calving, often spring calving, um, which helps with feed efficiency also, as well as labor efficiency. And then, um, what's often not talked about, and I think what's a little bit different about the focus of this work is the capital efficiency, right? Trying to maximize the rate of return on assets. And how do you do that? Well, in part, minimizing the overhead cost per hundredweight. There's a lot more to it, of course, in the return. There's direct costs, et cetera. Um, since we've started to talk about the low overhead dairy grazing system, I'm just going to scroll through some pictures from some farms that are doing this just to give you a sense of what it looks like. Some farms are outwintering like this one, and they've used these round bales to put up in two directions to create like a windbreak for cows. Uh, and you can see they have this up on a hill. A lot of farmers have told me that it's not the cold that's the problem, it's the mud. So really, you know, using bedding outside and finding high spots to keep the cows out of the mud during those seasons. Picture of uh, cows grazing in some snow, um, you know, bales set out to be fed um, uh, through the snow. Uh, and this is how some farmers are dealing with uh, feeding systems in the winter when, they, when they're out wintering cows. Here's a sort of a close up of that. This is a picture that I took in Missouri where there's a whole pod of these kind of low overhead dairy grazing farms set up by the New Zealanders and a bunch of uh, Missouri dairy farmers have taken up this, this system also. Innovative ways to feed lots of calves quickly. Uh, milk in here and nipples all the way around there. So um, efficiencies there. This is the holding area for a swing parlor, which is inside this building, right? So you get a crowd gate that comes around, pushes the cows through a swing parlor. And I don't know, this might be like a swing 20. So 20 cows would come in on this side. There's 20 units that hang in the middle. Each one gets put on a cow. All of them get put on the cows on this side. And while these cows are milking, 20 more are brought in and prepped if, you know, on the other side. And as soon as this cow's done, the, the, the claw is swung swung to the other side and put on over there and um, get that side milking and this cow, this side is released. So many of you have seen this before, I'm sure, but um, uh, this is, a, I think, an important piece of the system. So let me please uh, start to talk about the analysis that we did, the financial and environmental analysis, okay? So I wanna describe um, uh, the farm. And, and what we did, right? So we developed numbers with an expert panel. We did not try to collect actual dairy farm financial analysis from farms and, and average them for several reasons. One, there aren't that many farms uh, in the region doing this. Each farm has its own unique circumstances that make its numbers always a little bit different for whatever reason. And, um, and um, uh, you know, we just thought it might be cleaner to use an expert panel to create some hypothetical numbers. So on that panel, we had three farmers 
in the upper Midwest who are using the system and three farm financial experts who are familiar with the system. What we came up with is um, uh, basically a farm that has 240 cows on a, on a rented farm that has 360 acres, right? So you got one and a half acres per cow. Um, the reason we decided to have this be a rented farm is that again, there can be in owning a farm, many different ways to finance that, all which have an impact on the farm financial analysis. And so here we have a rent payment of $78,000 per year for that farm. Uh, it comes out to about $215 per acre if you don't include the buildings, et cetera. What we were thinking about here also is that there are a lot of farms that had 100, 150, 200 cows in a confinement, you know, freestall kind of operation that have gone out of business. And those farms are available. Um, I think there's a lot of competition for the land, but it is plausible to rent a farm like that. And so that's where we went with this scenario. Um, the farmer borrowed 285,000 to buy cows at 7% over five years. They borrowed $240,000 to retrofit facilities on this rented farm. So they put in a swing 20 parlor and a holding area, a drive-by covered feed bunk that's two-sided and a bedded pack uh, to have for housing for emergencies. Otherwise it's out wintering. The, farm, the farmer owns $270,000 worth of machinery and uh, half of that is still debt financed. And the total assets of this farm, and mind you, they're less than they would be if the farmer owned the land and buildings, right? It would increase this assets, the assets quite a bit. But in this model, it's about uh, 1.25 million in assets, about 5,200 per cow or about $35 in total assets per hundred weight. OK, the total assets for typical dairy farms range quite a bit, but generally from about 10,000 to about twenty two thousand dollars per cow. So a little bit more about the farm operation, um, medium framed cows producing about on average 15,000 pounds of milk per cow per year, uh, spring calving herd seasonal. So the whole herd's dry in January and February. Um, the ration that the herd's being fed, um, and it's a bit into the weeds here, and I apologize for those of you uh, who are not interested in it, but just bear with me. Um, during the grazing season, they get 12 pounds of grain, six pounds dry matter of corn silage, which is the CS, and as much pasture as uh, the farmer can get into them. In the non-grazing season, still 12 pounds of grain supplementation, but also now 12 pounds dry matter of corn silage and 17 pounds dry matter of, of hay or haylage or baleage. Uh, on this farm, there's an 18% cull rate. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the dairy sector, uh, typical in large modern confinement is, you know, 32 to 40% cull rates. Um, so the farm raises all the replacements and sells the extras which is uh, an important part of the revenue that we'll look at in a minute. This farm with the 240 cows has two and a half full-time equivalent workers. It's got the owner manager and one and a half uh, hired people. Okay. And the payment for the owner manager, there's a $55,000 per year salary that's included in the labor costs. And that's something that's a little bit different than most farm financial analyses that generally don't include the owner labor and management costs in there. So um, let me talk a little bit, still very much in the weeds here uh, about what we did called a Monte Carlo simulation, okay? So we used milk data, milk price data and feed price data from 2011 to 2021 for the region. The average of all of those um, uh, data points was $18.71 per hundredweight. <clears throat> the average grain price was $230 a ton. <clears throat> the expert panel assumed they thought conservatively that 
given the profile of these cows and how they're fed and managed, that there'd be about $1.50 a hundred weight in premiums for uh, butterfat and protein. However, averages really become less meaningful when there's large variability around them, which as we saw on milk prices, there is huge variability, right? So what we decided to do is this Monte Carlo simulation. And what that means is that in the spreadsheet we created to do all this analysis, um, we had it run automatically 10,000 times. And each time, each iteration, it pulls a milk price and it pulls a feed price from a distribution based on these averages and the um, standard deviation uh, in that distribution from the data. Okay, I want to mention also that that there was in the data a correlation between milk price and feed price, meaning that uh, um, they tend to move in the same direction. They're not perfectly correlated, but there was a decent correlation coefficient that we put in there. And I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. <clears throat> also, we allowed milk production to vary between 14,000 and 16,000 pounds per cow. So each iteration, it pulls these variables. It calculates for each iteration, so 10,000 times, the output variables we're interested in, like net farm income per hundredweight. Right? So you get 10,000 sets of the output variables, and you cr create a probability distribution around it. So you can see the probability of any given outcome. And I'm going to talk about those probabilities um, to, in, in a moment. <clears throat> so the milk price distribution here. As I said, the average milk price, uh, 1871, the farm was getting on average $1.50 uh, in, in, in milk price premiums for the components. By the way, if it's not obvious, I should mention that we're doing this analysis for producing conventional milk, not organic or grass fed, just in the conventional milk markets. And I wanted to do that for several reasons. One, because I just think <clears throat> conventional milk production and sales is more available to more farmers than organic is. And um, um, it just, well, just wanted to do it that way. Obviously, if you're fully pasture-based, it's not nearly as hard for you to get to organic or grass-fed as it would be for a farm in confinement. So, so and obviously a lot of grass, pasture-based dairy farms are organic or grass-fed. So anyway, um, this is what the distribution of milk prices looks like. It's a little bit skewed out here. I just wanted to show you that. And next, I want to talk about the milk to feed price ratio, right? Because this ratio is hugely important in the profitability of a dairy farm, okay? And so the milk to feed price ratio for those 10,000 iterations that we did, where each time it was pulling a milk price and a feed price from a distribution, was 1.68. Now, that number... I hope is meaningless to most of you because we don't just don't think about that number a lot. But what I, I want to put it in, into context, <clears throat> I was able to get these um, this graph from USDA Economic Research Service, um, which shows the milk feed price ratio uh, for a 16% mixed dairy feed versus one pound of whole milk. And as you can see, this is the green lines from 2010, the reds from 2014. These were the only years I could find this for. <clears throat> so a higher milk to feed price ratio is better for farm profitability, right? So the high point is here in September of 2014 at close to three, right? Maybe 2.9, 2.9. The low is sort of down in here in 2012 at, uh, you know, maybe 1.3. So our average of 1.68, which shows up around, would be around here, is pretty conservative. And that's what we were after in this analysis, right? We wanted numbers generally that would be conservative, uh, that would be achievable because, well, we want these numbers um, to be achievable. So I put this slide up here, not for you to be able to see these numbers because I realize it's way too crowded, but just to show you that this is the income statement or the profit and loss statement for this farm. And we did it for years one, two, three, four, and five, right? Because there's going to be a learning curve and uh, an adjustment period, right? So we were really only interested in the year five results once we got the farm got to some plateau, okay? So over here is the revenue, 
For year five, you can see it's primarily milk sales as dairy farms will be. There's also those significant sales of farm raised replacements here. <clears throat> the expenses, again, keying off year five, so the year five average per cow and average per hundredweight are these two columns here. <clears throat> Important to look at the feed costs, okay? So this is the grain or concentrates, the purchased hay, haylage, it's really be haylage or baleage purchased and purchased corn silage. As I mentioned, that's in the feed ration for these animals. <clears throat> A couple things here, these three line items total to <clears throat> $8.05 per hundredweight for purchased feed on the farm. Another way that these numbers are quite conservative is that the farm is going to have room to make stored haylage baleage from its pasture acres when the grass is growing faster than the cows can eat it. Um, however, we didn't count any of that. We counted all of the additional feeds, the grain and all of the forages that I mentioned before. We accounted for them at market values, like they were being purchased, okay? Um, the other important thing to look at is labor and management. It includes um, small benefits package, but this is the $55,000 per year for the owner, as well as the pay for the hired people, which I think was at $20 an hour for both, or maybe for the halftime person, it was 18, maybe it was 20 and 18, something like that. <clears throat> so these are expensive. These are big ticket line items to look at. Uh, the total down here, uh, the expenses per hundredweight of 1960. Uh, and we'll talk about that more in the next slide. Full cost of production, 1960 per hundredweight. In that year five, the net farm income from operations, uh, uh, almost $129,000. <clears> and again, remember that's above and beyond the $55,000 salary to the owner. As mentioned there, the, the net farm income per cow, 536 and per hundredweight, $3.64. <clears throat> I indicated already in the beginning at the takeaway messages that this was much greater than average. Uh, and we're gonna talk about that in a minute. The rate of return on assets, 12.2%. Admittedly, this number is much higher than it would be if the farmer owned the land and buildings rather than rent them. However, it's still, even with that, and I was able to play with the numbers to look at that, a still a very competitive uh, rate of return on assets, which isn't usually the case in dairy farm financial analysis. The profit margin, 15.7%, that's a metric that not, is not used very often. Uh, as we mentioned, total feed cost per hundredweight, $8.05. And importantly, in terms of labor efficiency, 1.4 million pounds of milk shipped per full-time equivalent worker. And that's about where the large modern, well, the large modern confinement dairies are probably greater than that, maybe getting to 2 million pounds shipped. But, but compared to traditional farms, this is a lot. <clears throat> so this <clears throat> distribution, this is of the 10,000 iterations of the spreadsheet in terms of net farm income per hundredweight. The, the, the average is $3.64. 80% of those 10,000 iterations are between, let's say, $2 and $5 with rounding, okay? Importantly, to put it in context, as I mentioned in the very beginning, again, this is not a scientific comparison because, I, well, it's, it's not a research study in that way, but I wanted to put this in context. So I went to FinBin, which is a data set housed by the University of Minnesota, um, and I took the dairy farm financial analyses from, from dairy farms that were in their system for 2011 to 2021. And there were hundreds in each year. And the average across all those years and all those farms was 88 cents net farm income per hundredweight. Um, what I wanna mention is that that also though does include a return like a, a family living expenses, sort of return to owner labor and management. So it is sort of comparing apples to apples <clears throat> in, in this way, but it's still, you know, this is about four times greater. Um, 
So even if our numbers are off, and they are, right, they're not, there's no absolute right here. It's still a huge uh, difference. So very quickly, I just want to talk about the environmental and, and other benefits briefly, and then open it up for, for uh, um, questions. <clears throat> so we're making the assumption here that there's profitable pasture-based farming, right? So at the farm level, yes, this makes sense. Farmers hopefully are, are going to be doing this more. But what about the off-farm benefits, right? There are benefits to rural communities. There's benefits to the environment. There's benefits to the food system. And I'm going to talk about those a little bit, but with a specific focus on uh, water quality and climate change. So what we did is use USDA's integrated farm system model. It's a process level simulation model that works on a daily time step to simulate the biophysical processes that you can see represented here. It uses uh, 25 years worth of daily weather from a local weather station, whichever one you wanna choose from around the country. We, for this work, chose one from Appleton, Wisconsin. <clears throat> so comparing an environmental comparison using IFSM, that model, of the low overhead dairy grazing versus confinement. So it's the same farm footprint, the same size of acre, amount of acres, the same soils, same topography, <clears throat> which is 360 acres of clay loam, gently sloping. The confinement scenario would have been uh, 130 cows at 24,000 pounds of milk per cow per year, um, feeding growing corn silage, some high moisture ear corn and hay, haylage, baleage, whatever. And the low overhead dairy grazing, as I described, is 240 cows, average 15,000 pounds per cow, and all in pasture, right? Permanent vegetative cover. What this showed us is that the phosphorus loss in pounds per acre on that confinement scenario <clears throat> was 0.7 pounds per acre per year of phosphorus, total phosphorus. And in the low overhead dairy grazing was 0.2 pounds per acre per year. So that's a 71% reduction, which is <laughs> significant. Nitrogen loss in terms of leaching and runoff, 62% um, reduction. And the reactive nitrogen footprint, which uh, um, you know, is, is rather complicated and, and uh, I'm not gonna go into the details on it, but a 26% reduction on that. In terms of the net greenhouse gas emissions, a little bit less, but not much less for the grazing over confinement. There's a couple reasons for that. The animal emissions, um, are a lot greater. And there's a lot more cows, right? There's 240 versus 130. So the animal emissions are a lot greater in the, in the grazing operation. The per cow emissions are almost as high. And there's um, a lot of science around that in terms of feeding more grain actually reduces enteric methane emission, right? So um, manure, manure emissions um, are lower on the grazing, of course, because they're not storing manure. But then you also have carbon accumulation in the soil, which all goes into this, right? So the takeaway is that, well, it's close on, on its climate impact. The other things, you know, there's some science around these things that the grazing, the pastures provide better habitat for birds, pollinators, and better impact on cold water streams for fisheries, um, rural community health in terms of economic multipliers, tourism, potential tourism impacts of the aesthetic working landscape, farm safety, worker conditions, and opportunities for ownership because it's a lower uh, asset, lower investment uh, system to get into. And then within the food system, greater longevity, reduced disease, reduced antibiotic use, um, conjugated linoleic acid and omega-3s, and there's an easier transition to organic and grass-fed from it. So the takeaway points again, Ideally, business decisions are based on profitability, not on cash flow, right? And the way you get there, in part, is by reducing overhead costs per hundred weight so you don't get caught in that overhead cost dilemma that I took time to explain a few minutes ago. Um, and by, by being able to have decisions based on profitability, you have a more flexible and a more nimble business in that dairy farm. So when the milk to grain price ratio gets real low, you could think about feeding less grain and producing less milk. That might be more profitable. Where, where you can't do that if you're stuck in uh, 
in a high overhead situation. Also, in sustained lulls of the um, price ratio, maybe you could pivot towards beef production because you have the pastures, you have the fencing, you, you have the ability to do that, and you don't have the overhead that's dairy specific necessarily that makes you need to stay in dairy. The efficiencies I talked about of the system, the feed efficiency, labor efficiency, and capital efficiency, and that the main profit metric, net farm income per hundredweight, what we're showing from this hypothetical financial analysis were results four times greater than what we can get from the data set from FinBin. Again, these are not perfect numbers on either side of this equation. We don't know much about all of the hundreds of farms that go into this FinBin, um, <clears throat> and these are hypothetical, but it still, um, I think, it gets my attention. And the win-win here really is that you have a more profitable system, this low overhead dairy grazing system that also has environmental and social benefits. So that's all I have to say. Um, let's open it up to question and answer. Well, at least questions and hopefully some answers. And there's my uh, email if anyone needs to get in touch with me. Yeah, thanks, John. What a great presentation. <clears throat> really a great like deep dive on <clears throat> the financials and benefits. Um, I'm just yes. glad I can't see the eyes of everybody <laughs> that they're totally glazed over. <laughs> well, good news is, is we'll send out the slide deck and this is being recorded so people can review over and over again at their leisure. Um, it was a lot of numbers, but it's important stuff. Um, so feel free, y'all, if you have questions to put them in the chat, you can also, there's a small group, so feel free to unmute yourself and ask them directly. Um, we do have one question in the chat from Pete. Um, as folks are kind of thinking about their questions, how does the system vary geographically, particularly to respond to the increased variability, temperature, heat, and rainfall and drought? Yeah, that's a good question, right? And I wanna just be clear that I'm not an animal scientist, um, I'm an economist. Mm -hmm. But from what I know of working in the sector, including in some tropical places and some more humid temperate places like Missouri, where I visited recently to see these farms. Um, dairy cows like it cool, right? But in the upper Midwest, <clears throat> like here in the Northeast where I'm based, we have a significant winter. So um, that provides challenges too. We have less of a dead spot in the summer, um, like they do in really hot places where you know, especially if it's dry, where you don't get a lot of forage growth, but we have that long winter that you need to have feed ready for. So um, it is important. And um, until recently, it's part of why I guess, it's why I had thought the system I'm describing is too different than what we have to really try to push forward on it. Unfortunately, I think the situation for dairy farmers in the upper Midwest and in the Northeast has become so dire and so many farms are going out of business that we need to start thinking about this very different alternative because I think it works. I hope that answers your question, Pete. Maybe not. Yeah, I think it gets at it that there is a lot of variability, but the system you know, can be adapted depending on that variability of where folks are. But the cows like it cool. And we have another question. Are these numbers being used for a Wallace Center project? Uh, yes. So these numbers were, this analysis was made possible by uh, the Grassland 2.0 project of the University of Wisconsin. Or, or coordinated by the University of Wisconsin, um, which we greatly appreciate. And so I'm gl glad for that question. And we're also um, pushing forward on this, based on these analyses, with a project to try to help interested dairy farmers in the Great Lakes Basin to um, adopt this system. Uh, or improve their efficiencies in dairy grazing so that we have more examples of highly successful dairy grazing operations that more farmers in the region can see and learn from and hopefully mimic to some extent. 
yeah so we'll have more information on that in um, a few months it looks like um, but thanks for asking Hannah um, another question do you have data on transition from confinement to low overhead grazing in other words um, what's the 12-step program so I'm probably not the best person to lay that out, right? Because that's really a technical dairy farm management system. However, uh, it's a lot of planning, right? What are the resources I have on my current farm? Are they able to accommodate with changes in increased herd size to, to capture these efficiencies? Um, how would that be set up? Um, so I guess I, I'm not really able to answer that in some detail, except to say technical planning, financial planning, um, to look at the numbers and see if it's going to work. Some farmers are on multi-generation farms that they don't ever want to move from, and I don't blame them. And, and there are other farmers who aren't as committed to staying where they're at and maybe are interested in finding a piece of land that's big enough to set up an operation like this. So, so there's many different ways that, that we can get to from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. um, well, I actually think that that question kind of leads a little bit into this next one. And, you know, I think in terms of like, what's the 12 step program, it sounds like, like a, that guide could be created by extension agents and folks like that. Maybe that's a, a space for um, those folks to make some resources for farmers. Um, and kind of in that similar vein, um, we have a question about um, you know, with all that's been done in the last couple of decades around low overhead dairy grazing and confinement, um, what prevents farmers to quote unquote see the pros and cons of the two scenarios and what needs to be done to get more farmers interested in low overhead dairy grazing? Yeah, so on the last part of the question, I think it's really important <clears throat> that farmers be able to visit farms like this, see how they work, especially ones in a similar climate to them, right? Because there's been several trips and I was on one last year down to Missouri to look at the farms there, but that's different. Um, it's very impressive. They're even bigger and more efficient than what I described. Uh, those farms, uh, the pot of farms the New Zealanders set up, they have between 550 and 750 cows per farm and four workers. So they have like 150 cows or more per worker, which is really something. Um, so I think farmers need to be able to see it, touch it, smell it, ask questions, understand it. I, no farmer should move forward based on this hypothetical analysis. <laughs> this is really just to start get farmers understanding what the numbers could look like and asking questions around it. Um, what was the first part of that question, Kelsey? I'm sorry. You, you kind of answered it. Uh, what prevents farmers from being able to kind of see the pros and cons? Like what, like yeah. maybe another way of saying that is like some misconceptions and what's getting in the way of, of yeah. transitioning. Well, I want to tell you, I was at, um, in 2019, the uh, Vermont did a, um, dairy farm summit, right? Because the situation had been so bad for a number of years. Farms were going out of business like crazy. The agency, the Vermont Agency of Agriculture brought in the CEO of that New Zealand investment group that has those farms in Missouri, brought him up here to talk and describe the system, which I thought was interesting because the Agency of Agriculture of Vermont is not necessarily a bastion of progressive thinking. And, and yet, they, they put this out there and the guy explained the whole system. And through the rest of that two-day meeting, I talked to a lot of farmers and asked them what they thought. And most of them said, yeah, it's interesting. Not for me. The reason is, one of the reasons that I heard a lot of them say is that, you know, you've got to be willing, especially if you're going to have a, a seasonal calving herd. Some animals are not going to breed back in time to make the calving window, and they're not, they're gonna, you're going to have to sell them. So you're going to have to be willing to let go of cows. And, you know, just a lot of farmers, that didn't sit well with them, I think. It's just so very different. And someone talking about it's not going to change their mind. It's not until more people are doing it around them. And quite honestly, it feels like a, a race against time at this point. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, back to your point about being able to go see and touch and ask questions on, on actual farms. Yeah. Um, along those lines, we have another question about who are the planners that um, that have access to the financial analysis, analysis, such as the one that you laid out to help support producers in making those decisions? Um, I guess... I'm not sure I understand the question exactly. Who are the planners who have access to it? Yeah, I think <clears throat> more generally, like who who else can have access to this kind of data to um, to to show to producers the benefits? I think we'd be very happy to share it with anybody who wants to use it in that way. Um, it's not proprietary in any way. Um, and you know, right now it's, um, well, I think it's a pretty small group, right? This is really a, unfortunately, a, a, a sort of radical and fringe production system. Um, we know it does work. It is being used by a number, a small number of farmers in the region. Um, so yeah, it could, any, anybody who's interested, I think should get in touch with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And hopefully we'll have more data to share at some point and, um, you know, that is kind of the key to, to showing folks the success that they can have. Um, we probably have time for one, we have two minutes left and I see that Juan just put another question in the chat. Um, can you talk about a farm which has been able to successfully make the transition and how they got the capital and or land to make the transition possible? Uh, first, hi Juan, uh, it's good to see that you're on. Well, I've known Juan for many years, uh, mm -hmm. a fellow Vermonter. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, you know, there's so few instances of this. Um, I don't really have great numbers on the transition um, and all that's involved, except in this analysis we did with the year one through five, where we made some assumptions about productivity changes over those years and the assets that are required uh, for this farming system. So, um, other than that, I, I guess I don't have real specifics. Uh, I don't have case study examples to point to, and I think that would be really helpful. Yeah. And I wonder about that farm in Missouri, they aren't in the middle of a transition, but they have the one that you visited. That's kind of an example of one that has successfully made the transition. Well, and there's a lot of farms down there, and um, that's a for-profit entity. Uh, they claim to be quite willing to share their numbers. Um, uh, so, yeah, I think we should look at that, really, and maybe mm -hmm. do a case study. I think that's a great question, Juan, from you mm -hmm. or some of your students, and thank you for having them participate, too. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, we love to see that. Um, and, you know, it is being recorded, so if, other, if you want to share it with other students that you have, too, um, it will be available. Um, but yes, great presentation, John. Thank you. That is all the time we are at um, the end of our hour together. I want to thank John very much for sharing this presentation. We are going to work hard on our end to um, get the recording ready to be put on our Pasture Project YouTube channel. So keep a lookout for that. As you exit the webinar, um, there is going to be a little survey that pops up. It's just a couple of questions to help us with our future webinar development. Um, in the chat box is my email address, John's, and my colleague, Jane. So feel free to reach out to any of us about any of this. Um, and we thank you all for spending time with us today um, and have a great rest of your day. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. And I think there are sandwiches by the door. So grab one or two yeah. on your way out. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. Thanks, guys.